The text of my message this morning is from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, You are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Let's pray. To Jesus, as we remember Palm Sunday, as we meditate on this text, remind us of what kind of saviour you are, that we and King you are, not only to remember that you are the Christ, but that you are the crucified Christ for us. So Lord, teach us and grow us through this your word. Your word is truth and life and light for our salvation. Amen. I should have Evelyn up the front to read this to you, but uh, you'll have to put up with my English accent. Paddy and Michael were two Irishmen with the same qualifications, interviewed for the same job and they did equally well in the interview. The hiring manager decided to give them both an exam with 10 questions in it to help him make a decision about which one to hire. Well, as it turned out, both of these men only missed by one question. And the manager went to Paddy and said, thank you for your interest in this position. And even though you and Michael are equally qualified and both only missed one question, I've decided to give the job to Michael. Well, Paddy replied, if we are equally qualified and interviewed equally well and both correctly answered nine questions, then why is Michael getting the job rather than me? Well, the manager replied, it was your different answers for the one question that you both missed. That is what determined my decision. Michael's answer to the question was, I don't know, but your answer, Paddy, was neither do I. <laughs> Poor Paddy, so close and yet so far. His sins found him out. He was someone who didn't really know. And as we approach this last Latin sermon in our series on the Messianic secret in Mark's Gospel, we discover that Peter does a similar thing. Unlike Paddy, he gave the right answer. But when Jesus began to explain what that answer meant, Peter showed that he didn't really know. He didn't really know what it meant to confess Jesus as the Christ. Today the secret is revealed, but because Peter did not understand what it was for Jesus to be the Christ, Jesus had to warn them not to say anything as he'd done to many others before in Mark's Gospel. So today the theme of my sermon is Jesus' final warning to secrecy, disciples do not tell anyone about me. Now, Caesarea Philippi is at, now, sorry, Jesus had just been to Bethsaida where he had healed a blind man. So our text begins, Jesus went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? Now, Caesarea Philippi is at the foot of Mount Hermon, the highest mountain peak in the promised land, rising over to 9,000 feet above sea level. 
a massive cliff at its base overshadows the city and it was a place filled with natural beauty. There was also a huge cave there that was filled with water that no one could actually ascertain how deep it was. It was probably the reason why it was such a beautiful place that there was a shrine to the pagan god Pan there. Jesus asked this question of his disciples in our text as they were on the way. Now, being on the way is a theme in Mark's Gospel. In Greek, it's hodos is the word for way. And it can refer to a road or path, or it can refer to a way of life. We find Jesus on the way when he asks this question of his disciples. This phrase again appears in Mark chapter 9, when the disciples indicate that they don't know the way. The most significant use of the word hodos is the story of blind Bartimaeus who is on the side of the way and then once he's healed, he follows Jesus on the way. And as you know, the way became a title for Christians in the book of Acts, people of the way. So who do the disciples say that the people think Jesus is? Jesus knows that his opposition sees him as a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of sinners, a pawn of Beelzebub. But the ordinary people, what did they think? And the disciples replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. John the Baptist, well, we can see why they would think that Jesus' preaching was so similar to John's, so he might have been John the Baptist. They both preached repentance and righteousness. Even King Herod thought that Jesus might have been John the Baptist raised from the dead. Elijah, well, the Jews believed that Elijah would come to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so... Jesus did miracles just as Elijah did, so maybe he was Elijah. Or was he one of the prophets? The prophets were great men of God who spoke out fearlessly against evil and injustice. That's what Jesus did, so maybe he was one of the prophets. Then the rubber hits the road. Jesus goes from public opinion to personal confession after the disciples had followed him for nearly three years. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered on their behalf, you are the Christ. We need to be he clear here that calling Jesus the Messiah doesn't mean calling him divine, or even the second person of the Trinity. Mark believes Jesus was and is divine and he will eventually show us where and why. But this moment in the gospel story is about something else. It's about the politically dangerous and theologically risky claim that Jesus is the true King of Israel, the final heir to the throne of David, the one before whom Herod Antipas and all the other would-be Jewish princelings are just shabby little impostors. The disciples weren't expecting a divine redeemer. They were longing for a king and they thought that they'd actually found one. But Caesarea Philippi was a dangerous place for such a thing to be said about Jesus. After all, there was a recently built temple there to the newest pagan god, the Roman emperor, the Caesar himself, a messiah announcing the kingdom of God was a challenge to Rome, 
If word got out, it would be met with swift, violent and merciless opposition. So what does Jesus do? He warns his disciples not to tell anyone about him. Yes, it is true. He is the Messiah. He is the King. But he's not the kind of king that they and all Israel were expecting. Peter and the disciples had the right answer. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. But they have the wrong understanding about his kingship. And what we go on to read, this is made clear in Mark chapter 8 verses 31 to 35. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. This is the kind of Messiah, the kind of king he was, a Messiah who would suffer and die and on the third day rise again. So how did Jesus giving the true meaning to what kind of Messiah he is, be received by his disciples. We read, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. When Jesus turns and looks at all the disciples, Mark is showing us here that it's not only Peter with that kind of attitude, it's all of them. They had all misunderstood what kind of Messiah Jesus is. And their wrong understanding shows that they were in it for themselves and have satanic, fallen human concerns. For them, Jesus would be the king and they would be his cabinet. Jesus would get all the glory and they would get some of it. After three years, they just didn't get it. Then Jesus called the crowd to himself along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. You see, if you want to be a disciple of this Messiah, this King, the call to you, as said by the German martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is the call to come and die. Anyone at the time of Jesus in Roman occupied Israel carrying a horizontal crossbeam was on their way to being killed or crucified. You carried your own cross to the upright pole upon which you were to be crucified. And on Good Friday we know that Jesus was beaten so badly that one of the soldiers enlisted Simon of Cyrene to carry his crossbeam. Jesus calls us not to die on a cross, but to die to ourselves. This is to be a daily event. When you begin to die to yourself, you begin to focus on others. Your focus must go somewhere. And so if you die to yourself, you make Take your focus off yourself and begin to focus on others. And as selfishness dies, otherness are born, is born. And that otherness is alive and powerful and grows. The whole process of this inner death and inner rebirth is a miracle, like the transformation of a seed. When a seed dies... It's not the result of its willpower, is it? But it is a miracle within the seed. Similarly, when we humans die to self, it is not the result of our willpower, but the working of the spirit of the crucified Christ within us. Jesus says that you are to 
deny yourself, to die to your own selfishness. We are to surrender our selfishness and self-centeredness to God and his Christ. Rather than serving ourselves, we are to serve God and other people. Those who did the Lent study with me on Mark this last Wednesday, Thursday, will remember that our lesson was about Jesus, the servant king. And as we follow this servant king and lose our life, our focus on ourselves, we gain real life, true life, life that blossoms into all eternity. The Lutheran pastor Ed, Edward Marquot asked a Bible study class, what does it mean to deny self? And these were some of their answers. To deny self means to give up your personal wants for the greater good, to put needs of others first, to take care of people whom God has put on our doorstep, to be like Mother Teresa in her selflessness, to daily drown my own needs and put the needs of other people before my own, to put aside those parts of our lives which are sinful and turn to Jesus, to be convicted of my own sin, that I'm not living a worthy life, to deny overeating, overdrinking, overworking, etc., to pray for other needs, others' needs ahead of your own, to give up a planned pleasure without being a martyr, to take care of a person in need that God has placed in front of you, for example, an ageing parent, a sick child, a foster child, to seek God's will and to let God lead us and daily submit to God. He also asked them, what does it mean to take up your cross? These are some of the answers they gave. Take up the burden of another person's life. To pick up the burden that is one in one's life, such, a, uh, such as a devastating disease or accident, or disability, to carry my brother or sister on my back because that person is my brother or sister. I do not think of them as heavy. To someone else it may seem that my mother or father is a burden, but they are not. To take up your cross is to be open and flexible to God's plan, to focus on the needs that God places before me daily to try to be loving every day, to have grace under pressure, and to go the extra mile and do our jobs of life well, and to work on my relationships with people I do not like, and to go against what our culture or media says is success. Well, if you didn't have any idea what it meant to deny yourself and take up your cross and live the life of following the crucified servant king, I hope you now have more of an idea and will make manifest in your life this kind of life of discipleship. So, in what we've looked at this morning, we have la laid the foundation for the revelation of the Messianic secret. And we will see it revealed on Good Friday. And you're all going to turn up for Good Friday, aren't you? So you can find out the answer. No sleeping in. Until then, you need to answer for yourself the question Jesus asked. What about you? Who do you say that I am? I'm sure that you could probably all answer like Peter, you are the Christ. You might even make it more personal like you are my king. But what kind of king is Jesus for you? Is he king you only call on when you're sick or in need? Is he king for you like those in the health and wealth gospel churches believe that He's just there to bless you with good things and if good things aren't coming your way, he's failing you? Or is he your saviour and that you believe he's constantly loving and gracious and 
forgiving and merciful to you that you can just basically live your life how you want to live and do what you want to do when you want to do it and ignore the fact that he's actually your king who has claims on your life. Yes, Jesus is your king. But what kind of king is he for you? Peter gave the right understanding. But, uh, Peter gave the right answer, but he had the wrong understanding. Do you? Jesus is the servant king, the crucified Christ. The life he lived, he lived wholly for God and for others. At the end of my sermons, I encourage you to live and share the Jesus life. It's not an attractive life. It's not an easy life. It's completely countercultural. Yet, it is the purest form of life on this earth because it is God's life. It is the life of love, the love that he showed us and has given to us in Jesus Christ. Are you on his way, on this hodos? One of our ministry emphases here at HDK is that we be a church that is Christ following. And if we are truly going to be a church that is Christ following, there is no other life that we can live here as God's people except the crucified life. So may God send us the spirit of the crucified Christ on this Palm Sunday so that we can live this life and have life to the full, life as it's meant to be lived for all the world to see. Amen. So Lord, we thank you for coming for us and showing us how to live the God life on this earth, the life of giving and sharing and caring. Lord, send us your spirit so that we as your people here in this church may indeed live the crucified life and in living the crucified life may lift up you as our crucified saviour and you will draw all people unto yourself. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great sacrifice, and thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. All praise and honour and glory be yours, this day and forevermore. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna. Amen.